Hello and welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. My name is Shogun. Today we have a Halloween special event on the topics of death, the undead, and demons. And my guest today is none other than Sir Eggbased, a very knowledgeable person uh, on all these topics. And so before we get into that, please make sure you follow our podcast on both YouTube and BitChute. And most of all, make sure you join the Roundtable Discord server where you can find links to all of our social media and everything else. So that being said, welcome, Sir Eggbase. Thank you for joining me today. How are you today, sir? Thank you, Shogun. Uh, thank you for having me on. I'm doing very well. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this event. So in the spirit of Halloween, we're going to get into, as I said, the topics of death, the undead or undeath, and demons or the demonic. So let's go through that essentially in order. The first question I have for you is death now, or the topic that we'll raise is death, because I know that you, I think you identify as new age to some extent, and you have very spiritual beliefs. So how do you understand death, right? This is the inevitable end of our mortal lives, of course, but what do you believe or know happens when a human dies? Uh, what do you think the process uh, resembles? So, it's a good question. I like the way in which you formatted it. I would like to stay away from the subject of the afterlife for now, just because we could, we could go on about the nature of uh, non-material existence for ages. But uh, the process of death is, uh, as I understand it to be, by study experience, where I won't appeal to authorities, but um, functionally, when you sign a contract of incarnation, which most of you have done, not everybody, some people are put here, uh, others agree to be here, there is a, a cord per se, it's not necessarily literal, although it sometimes does look that way, that binds the spirit to the body. Um, and it can bind anything to anything, but in this case, uh, what creates conscious life is the binding of a spirit to a body by a, a cord or a cable, right? And that cable uh, has a, a pretty great length, I mean, which allows you to travel outside of your body without dying. Death is simply the severing of that cord, the unbinding of the spirit from the body. I see. So once the spirit is unbound from the body by the severing of the astral cord or the silver cord, what is, uh, in your opinion or in your belief, the destiny of that soul, right? So if I right now go outside and get shot in the head uh, uh, and my, my silver cord is severed, what then would happen to, to what I call me? So this is interesting, Shogun, because there, there's a, an amount of borderline neurotic black and white thinking that occurs when it, it comes to uh, your destiny after your death. And especially on the part of Christians mostly, um, who are pretty firmly of the belief that the human soul serves primarily to bind you to a, a judiciary system in which you are either elevated or uh, what would be the opposite, um, the bound to hell, I suppose. And in my perception, it, this is almost as if you were to say that everyone at a bus station is either going to one destination or another. If I were to walk into Grand Central and say that everyone was either going to Coney Island or to Fifth Avenue, right? And it, that's absurd. It, it's positively absurd. There are people at Grand Central Station who are going to New Jersey. There are people at Grand Central Station who are trying to get to California, and they just happen to be at Grand Central. So it, it's... Asking me that question is, is very, it's a good analogy that I've just created. Um, no one, no two people are going to the same place necessarily. Okay, so for the belief that you can just take humanity and cut it in half, say this half is the elect, they'll go to the good place, and this half is the sinners, they'll go to the bad place. Or even for me to just say that everybody who leaves here is going to go get on some spaceship or whatever it happens to be is akin to literally taking a bus station and going in and saying that everyone is going to one destination or another. I am going somewhere. You are going somewhere. The other members of the audience here are going somewhere else. And that is for them to know and perhaps not for us to find out. 
Does that answer the question? Yes. Individual destinies. We each have our own individual fate after death, uh, probably karmically specific to us is what I interpret you to be saying. Um, and I have my own kind of thought about this, which is, is in line with that. Now, do you believe that the soul, and this is, I'm just going to kind of free ball off of these topics. Do you believe that the soul is eternal? In other words, that people's destiny is infinite, will never end, will go on forever, right? Just one experience after the other. Or do you believe there can ever be a, an, a definite end to the soul's or consciousness's existence? Well, it's all relative, right? So all, all of those, you know, end this um, beginning that they're all relative. So end of what? Um, and the answer, of course, would be like the end of personal identity. So that is possible. The end of existence is not, however. Um, consciousness is a universal. So when consciousness was created, I mean, God, that's such a... <laughs> we're starting to get into the weeds there. But um, functionally, what we're addressing is whether or not there's an end to you. Uh, there most certainly will be an end to you. That's when you go underneath the ground. Is there an end to capital Y, you? Well, there is. That's when everything rejoins with the egoless infinity. But life as we know it, existence, the purpose thereof is experience to stimulate individuation in a Jungian sense, to generate personalities which can survive said infinity. So ideally, we would never have to go back. Ideally, there would be no last man standing, and the diversity and collective would be steadfast enough to continue on into infinity. But um, unfortunately, in the many millions of times existence has been tried, it has always failed. And we have all ended up back in that same place where, uh, from whence we came. Okay, so we've now covered the subject of death, uh, and we should transition into the Halloween and uh, spiritual or conspiracy, not really conspiracy, but supernatural element of undeath. Uh, so I've changed my profile picture for the occasion right into the undead samurai, who is essentially an animated samurai uh, skeleton. And this is the concept of undeath, right? I mean, zombies, the uh, skeletons, vampires. The concept is essentially, uh, obviously, creatures that are still animated and still mobile and still have perhaps some agency, but are no longer mortal because they have already died, right? Now, I've named a few, you know, ghasts, ghouls, whites. There's many varieties of undead if you go by, you know, the Dungeons & Dragons Monsters Manual. But uh, these are not really creatures from fiction. They're, they're creatures that were at one time believed to be real. And I know from speaking to you that uh, you believe these undead creatures to be real. So let me ask first, what forms of undead beings do you believe actually exist in the real world? So first, I'd like to qualify undeath because you have basically bound me to um, however many creatures you listed. I don't actually believe in uh, almost any of those. Uh, ghosts are a thing. Um, ghosts is just, that's the phenomenological viewing of a spirit. So uh, dis in, um, a discorporated person interfacing with your mind and your perception. Um, vampires are, you could say they're undead because they don't actually have life force of their own. And in order for something to qualify as living, it has to be able to live unsupported by anything except the consumption of energy. So you could say they're living, you could say they aren't, but as far as humans are mostly concerned, if you just feed them and give them water and let them sleep, vampires will die, so I would consider them to be undead. Um, they're also very in touch with the state of death, so that places them in sort of an undead state. And uh, that is sort of what I'm addressing with the process of undeath. So undeath is just anywhere between life and death. You're not entirely alive, you're not entirely dead. So, for instance, people who have necrotized tissue, you know, we all have some part of us that's dead. We're all technically a little bit undead. But when you start to address whether or not the soul is actively sort of in death and sort of in life in the body, that is a state of undeath as well. So, really, it's pretty much anything you make of it. But personally, I would define the undead as uh, 
as I said, anything which can manifest itself in a way which we could call living, but is also very much not. So, again, vampires, ghosts. Um, the rest of them I'm not sure about. I mean, it took a lot of very compelling evidence to get me on board with the concept of an actual vampiric person existing. Um, so I, I would have to see equally compelling evidence for any of these weird ghasts, ghouls, goblins, whatever, what have you. But uh, it, I wouldn't put it past the point of possibility. Okay, that's a good answer. And uh, I know because we've discussed it that you have a unique uh, source of personal information regarding what we call vampires. Uh, in other words, you've, you've explained to me and um, gone into some detail about the fact that you have actually personally known people who were either uh, cursed, you might say, or afflicted with, or just simply, you know, infected with uh, a condition you would call vampirism. And obviously, mm -hmm. this is a, an experience that is pretty, pretty rare. Most people have not had this experience. So I feel like this is a really important topic for us to cover. So uh, first of all, who, who are, and I know you can keep their anonymity uh, protected, but who are the people in your life that have been affected with vampirism? Uh, to, to what extent can you tell us like, your relationship with them? So I'd like to start first by saying you said that it's a fairly rare experience. I categorically disagree. Um, you meet people who have this experience uh, on a fairly regular basis. I mean, if I were to give you the signs and the symptoms, and I'm sure I will before this episode concludes, um, I can give you at least some of them. Um, you would find that you are encountering these people uh, more regularly than you might expect. And it, the, what's sort of insidious about it is that most of them don't know. So most of them are entirely unaware of the fact that they have whatever this retrovirus is. And um, it, doesn't ne it doesn't necessarily affect their lives. They probably have uh, metabolic issues. They're probably experiencing most, if not all, of the more severe symptoms of anemia. And uh, some of them on the higher scale can be uh, porphyric to a borderline disabling level. Um, on my end, I know um, a few individuals. Uh, one of them I'm not so sure about, but um, most of them I met through spiritual communities through, um, interestingly, I, I met one of them through a dating app. Uh, and I went to high school with two of them. And they pretty much had uh, no idea about it. They, they basically had a fascination with um, death and blood and violence and uh, relation to animalistic tendencies. And eventually it got to a certain point in their lives where they started feeling very strange and all of a sudden they started just hemorrhaging weight. They started just losing, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds. They were eating normal diets, but they start losing weight down to the point where they're emaciated. And then they stay in that emaciated state where their skin starts to detach from their ribs. And um, they get down all the way to the point where basically they're skeletons, despite the fact that these individuals are eating 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 calorie diets. Um, it really is kind of amazing. And so you think that they're, uh, of course, that they have a, um, a digestive deficiency of some kind, that they're missing an enzyme. And that would be mostly accurate. I think what they're missing is heme iron, and they're missing a certain enzyme that's present in human blood that allows you to process heme iron. And due to that, they are... Uh, basically crippled digestively. And no matter how much food they eat, if they lack uh, these certain proteins and enzymes found in blood, they can't digest it effectively enough to uh, get the calories that they need to live. Uh, sorry. You're all right. Um, I will also note, just uh, while I'm on the subject of describing them, that it does have uh, some notable spiritual consequences for them. Um, almost every individual I've met who has this condition has described uh, seeing a mark on their forehead 
which is a like a sucking black and red mark right in the center of their forehead, which I would describe, but you would actually begin to see it yourself. Um, and that mark gives them great distress and does actually uh, move all the way back into their soul. And so spiritually, it's it's very distressing. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I got disconnected momentarily, but I, we can edit that uh, lapse out. I did hear everything that you said. Um, so just to clarify then, vampirism is essentially a disease or an infection. It, it is an illness or a biological um, pathology. Is that correct? It's, uh, I believe it's something to do with, um, yeah, I, biology, I guess, but it's a, it's a spiritual condition to begin with, which does have notable biological markers. So the physical effects of it are due to the biological mechanism. But uh, much in the same way that you can tell certain information about someone's spirit by looking at their body, you can, um, the spiritual disease, per se, does produce physical consequences. And uh, this would be one of the more extreme examples of that. So, as regards the spiritual condition, uh, I know you've said before that you tie this condition to the mark of Cain in the Bible, which, uh, for those who may not know, um, is something that was put onto the character Cain, one of the children of Adam and Eve, after he became the first murderer and murdered his brother Abel. He was marked by God with the mark of Cain. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, this is also the uh, story of vampirism from the Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, um, you know, world or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mythos. So, can you speak a bit about about the connection between vampirism and and this biblical mark uh, and spiritual qualities? Yes, I would like to pull up Genesis four fifteen. Um, give me just one moment. I hope you don't mind if I read Genesis four fifteen. <laughs> Of course not. The word of God is... Uh... Okay. So, Genesis 4, uh, Cain lures Abel out into the field. Uh, Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. The Lord said, Where is Abel's brother? Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not of I my brother's keeper. Uh, therefore he lied, right? And um, God says, well, basically, I... You're wrong. I hear his blood call out for me from the ground. And here's the line. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And then he gives him the mark so that he will not be slain, right? So, whosoever slayeth Cain, bended shall be taken on him sevenfold. Um, so, the curse and mark of Cain are inevitably tied, and the biblical interpretations of this are vast and usually erroneous. Um, of course, when it says that the earth shall not give you her strength when thou tillest the field, it means that food which you farm will not give you strength. Shogun, you're, you're echoing a little bit. I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me um, know. Uh, so basically, as I stated when I described these people, when they eat food, like normal people food, they are not given strength by it. Right, so that is directly in alignment with this passage, where they, they eat food from the earth that has been tilled from the earth, and they cannot ascertain, they cannot become strong from that food. They perpetually weaken. So, also, you are cursed from the, and this is the KJV, by the way, the, uh, the language used in a couple of other translations is very different. Um, usually, the Bible states that Cain is given the curse that he put on the earth by causing the earth to drink his brother's blood, right? So the earth opened her mouth to accept uh, your brother's blood from your hand, right? And now you are cursed as you cursed the earth. So cursed to drink blood. That is by and large the most logical interpretation of the curse and mark of Cain that I can produce, right? So uh, God says you are cursed as you have cursed the earth. Cain therefore has to drink blood. God says you will be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth and look at vampires. I mean, if, if you go out and claim to be a vampire, you'll be ostracized, made fun of. Uh, in the 15th century, you would have been killed. Um, 
And I mean, that was basically the narrative before, is that if you manifested signs and symptoms of vampirism, they would kill you and put a rock in your mouth and stake you through the heart and nail you to the coffin. So, I mean, that's fairly clear, right? So, of course, it's related. I mean, that's just a logical correspondence as far as I can see. And there are plenty of people for whom that's extremely controversial. And uh, many a Christian has gotten very mad at me for bringing that up. But uh, I hope it answers your question. I would also like to note that uh, Nod and the, descend the antediluvian descendants of Cain survived the flood because they did not need to breathe. So uh, they were capable of surviving the flood by being vampires. Just it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. And uh, I know I've said this before, and, uh, but it is interesting. I don't know if you've looked into it yet, but the, in my opinion, by far the best, um, you know, interpretation of the vampire mythos is from the vampire the masquerade uh, world of darkness uh, world and I, I am fully aware that you were not aware of this you hadn't heard of this you hadn't you weren't uh, hadn't read this at all but the similarities between what you describe in that world are extraordinary and uh, I don't want to be misinterpreted I think this is sort of like a case of um, either like we said before they're disclosing the reality through that that fiction or you're picking up psychically, um, you know, that vibration, so to speak. I, I can't explain it exactly, but I, I think this is close to the reality. So what I'm getting at here is in, in that world, there were characters called the Antediluvians, which were vampires who were so old they predated Noah's Flood. And they, exactly as you described, were able to survive, you know, buried under the ground or whatever the case may be you know, because they don't need to breathe and so forth. And the Mark of Cain was the origin of the vampiric curse. Uh, it's it's extraordinary how, how those similarities exist. It, it even talks about the Book of Nod, um, you know, and so on and so forth. But uh, I want to get into this a bit more. So you, you talked before about uh, having, I think, two different groups of friends or two different friends who had become infected with vampirism in two different ways. Uh, I have a terrible memory, as you know, so I'm, I'm trying to remember this. But if I am not mistaken, in one case, it you said it has to do with, I think, drinking the blood of the vampire or rather having the vampire drink your blood. But in the other case, it had to do with some kind of a satanic pact or, you know, dark ritual. Uh, is that correct? Indeed. Indeed it is. So I'll just go into it. Um, one of these individuals met someone who was like, ooh, I'm a vampire. If you drink my blood, you can be one too. And they were like, <laughs> you're joking, but that's kind of hot. And so they made it a sex thing and drank this person's blood. Little did they know, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other one, uh, you know, Satanist, abhorrent individual, dedicated to, I want to live forever so that I can continue to be evil and dominate my enemies and slay my foes with evil curses and whatever. Um, draws a circle, summons up, you know, ex president demon and says, uh, hi, um, something along the lines of, you know, hello, your eminence. Uh, I want to give you my soul in return for vampirism. Um, demon says, ha ha ha, you fool, gives him the mark of Cain. And um, yeah, I, I, that's a decision that you have to regret. I mean, if you're going to sell somebody your soul, you should ask literally for the everything and the kitchen sink. You know, I want $3 billion. I want 62 pounds of gold. I want a super yacht. I want a trophy wife. I want a whole room of concubine. And this guy's just like, no, uh, I want to be cursed to have to drink blood for the rest of my life. And um, yeah, that's just about it. <laughs> so um, the idiocy of that notwithstanding, uh, those are the two individuals I know of who have attained this curse through means that I can isolate. And then the others are just you know, they were born with it or whatever. I haven't really interrogated them about it because I'm just like, yep, okay, that's a thing. Go ahead on your day. Um, yep. So you were correct partially in your memory, but yeah. All right. Well, I guess if nobody has any questions, I'll go ahead and ask one. Um, have you ever come across any demons, man? And have you ever been possessed by one? 
Um, yes to both. Yeah, so um, I've come across many demons. Um, it's on the order of hundreds of thousands just by my interactions with people. Um, recently, I had to peel uh, not one, not two, but 364 demons off of a girl who was living in an apartment that looked like something out of hoarders. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm I physically shuddered at the thought, but um, I have seems... been possessed. Uh, I was possessed by Buer at some point. It was a president demon. It's associated with Sagittarius, and uh, that was not a good experience either. And I will say that demonic possession is a uh, a fairly strong and inimitably effective crash course in banishing. Absolutely, man. And while you were taking off those demons from that girl, was she telling you anything personal? Or was that demon telling you anything personal about your life that kind of like opened your eyes a little bit? Like, whoa, how does she know this about me? Or was it just like, oh, no, the uh, the Praetor natural knowledge thing didn't have to come into effect because I knew what was going on and they didn't want me to know. So uh, usually demons who do that are trying to intimidate you or, or they want their presence to be known. Um, I was going to kill and eat these demons, so they were actually trying to hide from me, if anything. Um, how does, does that answer your question? Eat, how does one eat demons? Uh, well, if you're more powerful than something, you can consume it and gain its power, Sorry. as far as spirituality is concerned. I disconnected for a second there. I hope I'm not roboting too badly. Um, you're not at all. Okay, great. So, but yeah, I noticed that while I was away, we did transition from vampires to demons, which was the next topic in line. So, uh, I would like to ask Eggbase just to get the foundations laid out. Uh, what is a demon? Uh, you know, what is a demon? How do these beings come to be? Uh, you know, how would we define them? So, again, we're, I'm going to have to give, you know, something, something, no black and white thinking, something, something. Because uh, we're not talking about a very well-defined group of, of characters. We're talking about basically a series of spirits which have been labeled as demons uh, via Goetic traditions, via Christian traditions, uh, via any of the number of grimoires which have been affected. And the term demon is somewhere between a derogatory and an identifier for either a spirit that is associated with forces that humans do not like, or a spirit which is, uh, by definition or by its own nature, um, malicious or dishonest. And that is generally the way in which the term is used. So it, it denotes nothing other than uh, the way in which people feel about it, usually. Okay, so does there exist, or do there does there exist um, a category of entities that are malevolent, meaning hostile or evil, non-human, right? So they're not ghosts of dead people; they are something different. Entities, right? So, because if we say there's ghosts, which are the you know the spirits maybe of like some serial killer that's like malevolent, non -human, or sorry, malevolent and hostile and spiritual, but uh, I postulate that these are a different category, these demons, which, you know, whatever they are, are non-human hostile spirits. Do you believe these exist? Okay. Uh, non-human hostile spirit is very, very unspecific. So, uh, yes, categorically, yes. Um, there are actually beings that dwell in hell, and you could define those as demons. Like, there is a hell. There are many hells, but uh, we have one that we refer to as hell that people have seen and written about, including but not limited to uh, Signor Alghieri. Um, I would like to go on to say that these non-human malevolent entities, it's a very broad qualifier, as I said. So there are non-human malevolent entities who were once humans and have now literally abandoned all of their humanity. And there are non-human malevolent entities who are just non-human to begin with. You know, they could be Syrian. They could be Alpha Draconian. The Alpha Draconians are pretty bad. Um, Zeta Reticulans and Alpha Draconians are usually labeled as demons by humans. So uh, put that in your pipe and smoke it.
All right. So now we are tying into another really interesting topic, and I will turn it over to audience participation very soon. Um, which is the the connection between aliens and demons, right? NSA is not here right now, but uh, the number of times I've heard him debate with people about whether aliens are demons or not, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time, right? So Christians basically believe that, that aliens, extraterrestrials, uh, are actually demons masquerading as aliens. Uh, and obviously, uh, people like NSA believe that demons don't exist, but are simply human misinterpretations of aliens. So mm -hmm. where do you, and I, someone like myself, believes that both categories of entities probably exist, but uh, as, as independent of one another. But what, what would be your take on this overall? And then after that, uh, I think we will turn it over to the audience, although I have more questions. But uh... So I, I'd like to make this extremely clear. This is a question I'm very well equipped to answer. Demons, by and large, and I'm making a universal claim, so there are, of course, going to be exceptions to this rule. Demons, by and large, are spirits. Those spirits may or may not be, at this or any other time, occupying a physical body, for instance, an extraterrestrial. Um, yeah, wow, I managed to say that rather concisely. So we're not referring to one or the other. By definition, we are referring to both. And I will notice that NSA has been summoned by the mere mention of this subject. Yeah, I was like, I thought I just said he wasn't here, but he's right there. I thought I, I, was, I, I was. I just was transferring from my phone to my phone. Okay. So uh, I have many more questions, but I want to open it up for the audience. If anyone in the audience has questions or comments um, for Mr. Egg Based, uh, go ahead at this time or any time from now on. Okay. Well, if nobody has a question for egg based, I would like to ask this. So, if there are, okay, well, so if there are these uh, spirits that exist that we might call demons, um, can you tell us about the practice of summoning them, binding them, and you know, turning them to your will, which is typically called sorcery? Uh, do you practice this, and can you tell us? Uh, well, do you practice sorcery in this nature? Uh, well, if you're going to define sorcery as just demonolatry, I will say that that is a radically insufficient definition of sorcery, in my estimation, but that's quite all right. Not everybody cares what sorcery is. Um, I am not a sorcerer, so-called. Uh, I That does not mean that I have not summoned and bound demons. That does not mean that I have not um, exercised demons does not mean that I do not regularly interact with demons. It simply means that I do not deliberately and frequently, uh, or even habitually, I, I do not in any respect uh, rely on, depend on, or receive from demons anything which significantly affects my personal practice. Uh, by and large, I prefer to avoid them at all costs, uh, but they are a, a necessary eventuality, and I'm going to sneeze, so I'll mute myself. Um, I had a question. I was I was wondering, uh, how do you attract, or how does a demon uh, decide to uh, take control of someone, or how do you uh, like get a, a demon, or uh, is it like too much drinking, or like some sort of action that that's, you're taking? That's uh, that's wonderful. I th I think I understand the the good faith core of your question, which is um, you're basically asking why and how, right? So yeah, um, okay. It's entirely possible. So uh, portals, we need to talk about portals. So trauma is a portal. Um, excessive drinking, self-destruction, suicide attempts, all of these are portals. Uh, basically, if you have enough emotion, if you charge your consciousness with enough of one frequency, it actually will tear open a, uh, basically like a big portal with a billboard on it that says, here is a person who is having a really rough time. And so anything that wants to fuck with people who are having a really rough time will just rush into that. And so this woman who I said I peeled off um, 364 spirits from her, uh, she's having, uh, um, let me put it this way, she has lived a life that no one here would survive, myself included. I would not have survived the life that she's led. So, so many things have found their way into her because she has given up on life. She is entirely submitted. Uh, she does not value or protect herself in any way mentally. 
she accepts thoughts, she accepts negative things directed towards her. So she is the prime candidate for accepting negative energy. Uh, for instance, I drink, uh, I drank a little too much last night, but I did it because we were having a really good time. And um, that was the goal. And we were all just having fun. And, uh, I made Algol swear fealty to me. So um, alcohol doesn't open a portal for me. Um, it does give me a certain spiritually valuable dissociative state, but it does not um, attract demons to me per se. So you can basically, um, you can attract things to you by being like them, by having energy that is similar to them. So evil spirits, if you pursue evil, they will come to you. Uh, spirits of tragedy, of depression, of destruction, of mental chaos, if you allow them in, if you um, have been prone to having those states of mind and allowing them to occur and not counteracting them, then you're letting them in and they will come to you, certainly. It's the same, it's basically the inverse of seek and you shall find. It's uh, accept and it shall be brought unto you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have a question following from this. Uh, so we'll, uh, I have a prelude question and then a follow-up question. So the prelude question is, I'm assuming based on what you've said, but just to be clear, do you believe that possession exists? In other words, that a demon can possess a human in such a way as to sort of puppet them, uh, you know, pilot them in the way that a person might pilot a vehicle or, you know, control them more or less, either willingly or unwillingly. Can a spirit inhabit a human and, and sort of uh, control them? One thousand percent. So the natural state of life is possession. Your consciousness possesses you basically. Uh, the natural state of life is that you as a human have a spirit inside of you that exerts control over you. That's how it's supposed to work. So pretty logically from there, we could state that it's possible for multiple spirits to be uh, inside of you affecting you. Now that, that's not a good thing necessarily. It can be. For instance, I had the Archangel Mikhail riding around inside of me for a good five or six months. And that was a fantastic experience. I almost became a Catholic priest, which is not so great. But it was a very fantastic experience. I gave the laying on of hands to a couple of men who were very sick, and they recovered. Um, I didn't know personally that I was as possessed by Mikhail as I was, but um, that is the kind of possession that people pray for and want. I mean, it, I could name a few examples. Possession by the Holy Spirit. Possession by uh, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Um, possession by angels. Uh, possession by ancestors is something that people pray for in ancestor worship. Uh, possession by spirits is a big one in um, Santeria. Uh, let me see what else. Satanism. People love being possessed in Satanism. So it, it's very common. It certainly exists. And um, it's sort of like the common cold. I mean, everybody's possessed to some degree. Uh, unless they have a, un, Literally, unless you have a regular banishing practice, that could be prayer. It could be uh, being in a fraternal organization where you sit in a building and deity is invoked into that building. Basically, unless you're defining boundaries with externality and using power to clear those boundaries out of anything that could be inside of them unintentionally, you, there's something inside of you that is affecting you unintentionally. Um, could be dream eaters, could be sleep paralysis, fear eater, parasite spirits. It, there's a whole list i actually have a whole classification system um but yeah it everybody is possessed to some degree everybody in this room uh, except the practicing occultists and the devout christians and anyone else who has anything that could qualify as a banishing practice um everyone's possessed I see. to some degree so if somebody were possessed uh, by a malicious uh, spirit or some kind of uh, perhaps negatively aligned spiritual entity, hypothetically, would this cause uh, permanent or long-term damage to that person's soul or something like that? Or is it more like your car gets hijacked, you know, the demon drives a car and eventually he's ejected from the car and, and you go back to normal? Or would it cause some kind of corruption, if you see what I'm saying? Like, once you're possessed, you're never the same after that, or in some negative way, you've been changed. Okay, so, so let's use the car analogy, okay? Because I love that analogy. I'm so glad you arrived at it independently. 
So what I said earlier is that everybody's possessed to some degree unless they have a banishing practice. So let me put it this way. If your body and your consciousness and your mind and whatever is the car, you, your soul, are driving. Unless you lock the doors intentionally, unless you literally get everybody out of the car other than you and lock the doors, which is a banishing practice of some kind, it could literally just be taking time to feel good about yourself and value yourself and want to be yourself. That is all it takes. But a lot of it's more complicated than that in order for uh, more powerful energies to be dispelled. Unless you're locking the doors to the car, there's almost always going to be someone who's managed to get into the back seat. Okay? And then sometimes people get up into the front seat and they start yelling at you about how you should drive and how you should steer the car off the road. And then sometimes somebody pulls over, hits you over the head, drags you out of the driver's seat, throws you in the trunk, and drives the car. And that takes a very powerful spirit or a very disempowered human being. And you can get the car back and get driving it again, and it won't cause you any damage unless the driver crashes the car. You understand? So unless while out of control, you harm yourself, you harm others, you, do, you make decisions that you can't take back. In those cases, the car is damaged. You understand? Or it's driven somewhere. You know, like somebody could hijack your car, drive it to Texas, and then give it back to you. And you're now in Texas. So uh, not that Texas isn't a great place to be, all my Texans out there, but um, Texas is not where I would have started. You know, I started on the, the Northeast Coast. So, um, yeah, I hope that explains that. It does. It does. Um, so while we're on the subject of Halloween and spirits, uh, let's talk about ghosts, if we may, since sure. we've talked about vampires. So what is the situation with ghosts? Why? Okay, so first of all, when we encounter like a ghost story, is this indeed the residue of a human being who has died? Like, is this somehow the, the person dies and their spirit remains on Earth? Is it what it appears to be? Um, is it what it appears to be? Well, there are <laughs> 62 billion question. ways in which it yeah. could appear. So. If I can clarify my question. Yeah, please. When we see a ghost, is this indeed the residue of a dead human? Um, when we see a ghost, uh, no, it's just a spirit. Uh, could be, but not necessarily. Okay, so this is because Christians believe uh, that, you know, or at least some Christians believe that ghosts are actually demons masquerading as the uh, spirits of dead humans. But other people believe that ghosts are indeed like maybe if a human dies under a situation of trauma or great stress, like a murder victim, the soul might not transition to the afterlife and therefore remain as a residue or as a a remnant on earth right and so that that was what i was incoherently trying to get at is are, are these really the the residues of of humans who have died or is this perhaps uh, a spirit or something masquerading as a human so as i said it could be any of these um the archangel michael has appeared to me as my grandfather whose name was also michael many times um He's either appeared with him or he's appeared as him so as to be familiar to me. And um, that is a possibility. Um, Christians will label anything as a demon. Um, I could wave my hands in the air and say the sacred names of God in Hebrew by vibrating them. And if it sounded sufficiently black magic-y to a Christian present, despite the fact that I'm literally invoking the god they worship, they would call me demonic. So the perception of these preternatural phenomena by the undereducated and the incoherent is not of any significant bearing to the phenomenological descriptors themselves. So I, I don't really care uh, what people call ghosts like oh ghosts are just demons or oh ghosts are just human spirit it, what i care is what it actually is 
And um, as far as experience, experimentation, and consultation with all of the you know hundreds of people I've encountered who have had these difficult to explain experiences, spirits can manifest themselves, uh, especially to a mental like uh, projection, especially to someone as a thought or as a sight picture, um, or especially, especially, especially in dreams. And those can be spirits of any kind. Uh, the spirit of my dog comes to me a lot. I bring the spirits of my cats with me in dreams. Um, so, uh, Shogun, the, the part that you missed there, um, just that spirits of any kind can be become manifest, especially in dreams. The spirit of my dog, who has passed, uh, has come into my dreams many a time. Uh, the spirits of my cats, who are very much alive, uh, when they sleep, they come with me in my dreams. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, ghosts, so, ghosts, not necessarily human. Go ahead. I just had a quick question because uh, that's something really weird happened to me, and it's when I was uh, I was in my bed and I was just looking at my phone and I was just looking at the internet, like like news, and then I fell asleep with my phone in my hand. And then I started having like a demonic dream and the phone rang in my dream. And then I picked it up in the dream. There's like a demonic voice. And uh, then I woke up and instead of it being on an internet browser, it was on the calculator and, it, and I typed 666 into the phone. And I was just like, whoa, that's, that's crazy. And some people say that uh, spirits can come through electronic devices or they can use electronic devices. But uh, it, was, it was really weird because I would have had to go to the calculator and then type that in while I was dreaming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I will say this to you. The ancestors of the practice, people who did this hundreds of years ago, would look at the reflection of a candle in a black mirror so as to uh, divine information, infinite, please close your mic, uh, so as to def divine information and to contact the spirit realm and to see things. The process was called scrying. Luckily for us now, we have LEDs. So we are looking at the light of a diode behind a black mirror. And that is the way in which we interact with uh, the internet and screens, and whatever else. So um, electronic devices, perhaps, although not very common at all, um, screens, however, TVs, laptops, cell phones, absolutely very common, very easy. So, yep, uh, you're right on the money with that one. And uh, I'm sorry to hear that you had such a disturbing experience. Anybody else or uh, Shogun? I'm going to, yeah, give it. Does anyone in the audience have a question for Mr. Eggbase? All right. So uh, while we're on the subject of ghosts, um, hauntings, perhaps we could discuss. OK, so maybe I can get your opinion um, on something uh, and I'll I'll tell you this, the story quickly that I've told before on the server. Uh, one of the stories. I don't think I've told it to you, though, before I guess. As far as I recall, maybe maybe I did. Actually, I did actually tell you before the time about the flashlight at my cabin. Right. I, mm -hmm. I just, yeah you you right. told me that story right so i guess rather than retell the whole story then i'll just ask do you believe that was a the spirit of a dead human involved in that and uh, do you think it was a poltergeist uh or to clarify my question is a poltergeist a human spirit or is it a non-human spirit right and a poltergeist again is like these entities that kind of knock on your walls in the night and uh, throw things through the air or, you know, move things around. Is that uh, some kind mm, of mysterious okay. non-human spirit or is that uh, the residue of a dead person, in your opinion? Well, I don't want to fuck with the uh, human or non-human distinction again because it's pretty much a non-sequitur. Um, it's just a spirit. Could be a spirit that wasn't a human, could not... Um, my grandparents knocked on the walls of the uh, house in which both of them lived and one of them died for a long time. And I could ask them questions and they would respond. Uh, and they'd provide 
pretty good answers. I just had to figure out how to do the communication correctly. Um, so that was, you know, that was the thing. Uh, poltergeists usually, like Shogun, your story, or when people start to describe like children's hair being tugged at and stuff, that is where we start to get into the realm where I doubt, I very much doubt that we're discussing a human. Um, because I'm sure if, if someone lived a bad enough life, like if you had somebody imprisoned in your basement and you went down there on a regular basis and did all kinds of unseemly things to them for their entire life and then they starved to death or something, uh, your house would probably be very, very, very haunted. Um, for instance, there's, there's a hotel in which many, many, many murders took place. Um, there are, of course, there are probably hundreds of those. But there are hotels where many murders took place, and depending on the circumstances, those can have major manifestations. So uh, if you have multiple human spirits, um, generally the spirits that come to be human are, are fairly low on the uh, order of hierarchical power. Uh, so we start to describe demons when we start to talk about physical manifestation. But if you have a lot of humans that are all basically feeling the same way in a certain area, that is a very powerful thing, even in life, uh, let alone in death. I see. Uh, and so to go back to the question of sorcery, um, can you tell us a bit about the practice of of sorcery, right? And uh, I know there's other kinds of magic that don't involve the binding and compelling of, of spirits, but can you tell us about the kind that does? Uh, whatever you, you can say about this. Okay, so the binding and um, we'll call it enslavement, because that's what it is. And people like doing this to angels, and I hate those people. Um, I hate them. Like, I genuinely hate them. But what you can do is, uh, if you have something's name, that immediately gives you its power. So, um, for instance, the Shem HaMefrash, the 72-character name of God, if you possess that name, uh, unfortunately, you can command God. Um, it results in your death in, in the very permanent and very uh, spiritual sense. I mean, like, what are you going to do? Like, he will let you use the name, but he won't let you survive afterwards. So you do kind of throw yourself down on the sword there. People have done it for all sorts of reasons. The most classic one is to save the world. Um, but if you have something's name, you can conjure it up. Uh, so demons, angels, whatever. And if you bind them into something and then curse at them and threaten them and, and promise and swear that you will torture and subdue them and whatever else, then eventually they'll do whatever the hell you want. So um, that tends to be a, a popular practice in some circles. And uh, that's usually described as demonolatry. Um, even in the case of binding and enslaving angels, I would call that demonolatry because you are yourself then becoming uh, definitely a demonolater. Angelology is basically where you summon, you invoke angels and ask them nicely and pray with them and ask them to help you in the name of God. That is very different. I'm a fan of that. I believe in people's power and ability to do that because ultimately that's what angels are meant to do is to help people in the name of God. Right? So there's that. Uh, but demonolatry can yield you all sorts of things. Uh, the the mo the primary one is possession. Um, if you want to be possessed, start summoning demons. Um, but provided you're not an idiot, um, and I, I mean, 15% of the people on the earth can't think and breathe at the same time. So <laughs> I, I very much doubt that uh, the majority will get past the first couple of requirements for Salomonic initiation which is usually why I just tell people to stay the hell away from it. But um, those who do survive uh, the beginnings of their demonolatry without possession, um, powers and knowledge beyond the, uh, the pale will be yielded unto them if they do it correctly. 
and of course it's cheating it, it's cheat codes basically you're you're calling up the play testers the qa testers of existence and saying hi i would like you to tell me how to break the rules and in doing so they can uncover things for you and they can teach you things but you are gambling with your soul you are playing a game against the house it's rigged and the house almost always wins and the only way the house doesn't win is if you eventually stop so it's like heroin i mean it, it goes one of two ways you either once you start doing heroin you either stop or you die once you start doing demonolatry you either stop or you lose your soul um yeah okay so uh, I had a question. I don't want to forget, but what you said about lose your soul put another question in my mind. Oh, yes. So my question was, uh, is there a way, a surefire way, that a person can test whether or not they are possessed by a demon or whether or not there's a demon influencing them in the same sense as like a spiritual pregnancy test or something like that, where you could get like a, a, a certain result, like do I or do I not have a demon with me? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. There are spiritual pregnancy tests, and that's why I was. <laughs> that's why I thought it was so funny. Uh, we should talk about astral pregnancy at some point. But um, there's no surefire test for anything. Um, nothing on the spiritual level is idiot proof. Um, I have yet to meet someone, uh, or, or or excuse me, I've yet to meet a practice which someone was not capable of fucking up. So. There's no surefire test of anything uh, because there's no surefire in spirituality. People will always be idiots to some degree. I mean, I'm I'm still about 15% completely moronic. So uh, that's just an unfortunate reality. 15% of the time, I just do things wrong. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of life is that you make mistakes. Right? But um, in terms of testing if someone is spiritually possessed, uh, I tend to ask them how many personalities they have, and they are usually compelled against their will to answer with a non-zero number greater than one if they are possessed. Um, I have unironically had people say, too many to count, more than you know, uh, legion. I've had someone unironically growl legion at me in response to that question. Um, uh, so many things like that, but most of the time I get like three, and then they say what, <laughs> and and then I help them out. But um, that tends to work for me. Uh, it doesn't work all the time. So uh, there, you usually have to employ multiple litmus tests. But asking somebody how many personalities they have is a pretty effective way. All right. Uh, you also mentioned losing your soul earlier. Um, under what conditions is it possible for a human to lose their soul in a permanent sense? And what would be the implication of that? Well, let me put it to you this way. That's a good question. Um, if I tell you, if I were to ask you the same question about losing your life, right? Like you would say literally that losing your life is when your heart stops beating and you die. But uh, theoretically, if you were bound to slavery for the rest of your life, you would have also lost your life as you know it, right? Um, if you were sold into sex, the sex trade, you would have lost your life, basically, as you knew it. So it, it's much in the same way uh, with your soul. Uh, you lose your soul if you suffer the second death, but you also lose your soul if you bind yourself to a contract which you cannot escape. So or if you just bind yourself to a contract that's going to go on for an inimitable amount of time. Like, um, recently I had a guy come to me and attempt to force me to teach him how to sell his soul into 100,000 years of servitude to mammon for, uh, I think it was a couple billion dollars. And... Um, I, I didn't teach him, but he ended up finding out how to do it. So, uh, unfortunately, that that man lost his life um, 
as I said, Shogun, I, I didn't teach the man how to sell his soul into 100,000 years of servitude for a few billion dollars, but um, he did figure out how to do it. He did do it. And that man, as far as we're concerned, has lost his life. So there's that. Um, you can also lose your life if you suffer the second death, as I said, which would be uh, being killed or struck down in a spiritual sense, such that your identity is removed and all of the progress you've made in existence is wiped. Uh, anybody have a question? I got a question. What constitutes a contract? Uh, I've asked this question before in the uh, roundtable, but uh, essentially, uh, when I was in eighth grade, I sold my soul for a sandwich. I was being kind of like a snarky, agnostic, atheist kid back then. I don't know what I was doing, but I did end up getting the sandwich. Uh, do I have a soul, and what con constitutes a contract for soul binding? Uh, yeah, you have to know. Um, you do have to know. So your words have to carry the power of your soul in order for you to actually be able to bind it to something, which is part of the reason why uh, there's a point of no return in spirituality, because once you gain the power of your soul and it begins to communicate through your voice as mine does, you can then unfortunately bind yourself to things. So uh, magical bum, if I say, um, by the power vested in me, I will not call you a bitch for the next five minutes, so mote it be. Uh, I've now made a contract with you to not call you that word for the next five minutes. Um, and that is, you know, I mean, that's a contract. Uh, but it's it's sort of like this. I can't sell you a house if I don't have a house to sell you. Um, much in the same way, if you don't have any equity with your soul, if you don't have any control over it because you haven't integrated it, and you're just a human being that is nominally possessed of one, then I don't believe it's within your power to bind it to anything. But uh, you in your present state, having, you know, matured and learned and now carrying the power of your soul could feasibly bind yourself to something, which is unfortunate. I hope you never do. Oh, no, I learned my first time around the sandwich was subpar. Um, but the sandwich know. is always subpar in the case of selling your soul. Um, <laughs> that's, it, it, that's actually... It's never enough. Um, what about your uh, your friend? Did he end up getting a billion dollars? He found out how to sell a soul, but how would that work? Like, is like, does a demon pop in front of him? Hey, here, here's your billion dollars. Or like, does he just like one day happen to get lucky, uh, you know, investing stocks and the one stock that, you know, ends up shooting, makes him a billionaire or something. Well, unfortunately you need like a degree in law in order to actually get anything out of demons. Um, so what's probably going to happen is that his uh, great, 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 great granddaughter is going to have made the billionth dollar descending from him. And uh, that will qualify as the terms of the contract having been fulfilled. And uh, in return, Mammon gets 100,000 years of slavery from him. So uh, unfortunately for that individual, he's a fucking moron. And uh, he has literally thrown himself on the existential sword for nothing for the equivalent of like some sand in his mouth <laughs> you know what i mean so um for him it won't work but if you were to go and write out a contract which is binding which actually describes the terms and conditions in explicit and inescapable language you can get some really crazy shit from demons like really really astounding stuff um, yeah, for instance, I held Astaroth's child hostage for a while and said, uh, like, uh, Astaroth's child, as in a, a demon, not a person, but, um, like a, a demon child of Astaroth, hostage on the astral plane for a while, and I said, uh, Astaroth, I want you to release, um, you know, I, whatever number of people who you are currently affecting or possessing, and I will release your child unto you. Um, so basically, people I don't even know who were being influenced by this major demon, I said, uh, release them, or and uh, I won't, you know, fry your kid. And uh, demons respond to that sort of rhetoric. So that is a contract, you know. 
Um, and it's it's fair that we make contracts with our, our voices every day. For instance, uh, I made a contract with Shogun when I said that I would be present for his podcast and would do an event. And uh, I didn't say, so mote it be. I didn't bind myself under any powers. I didn't say this, my will be done. You know, I didn't say amen. But uh, I still bound myself to be here. And if I had reneged on that, if I had not been present, uh, I, it would have weighed on me pretty heavily. So that's all it takes. And then, of course, it's a sliding scale. So as you increase the stakes, uh, so too do you increase the effects. Yeah, I, I have a question. I was wondering, how do you identify uh, a spirit or a demon that has possessed you or, or someone else? Oh, yeah. How do you get the name? So yeah. if any of you have seen... Uh, if any of you have seen exorcism movies, the name is like the hardest part because you got to know who it is if you're going to cast it out. So there are a couple ways to do it. Um, you can't, normally what you do in demonolatry is you have its name, you have its office, you have its whole identity, you know exactly what it looks like. So that's the spiritual equivalent of like first grade shit. I mean, you, you know right who it is, you know exactly how to bind it, it's all written out. You just have to follow the recipe, per se. But, uh, for instance, when I meet somebody and they're possessed by, like, X archdemon, I'm usually like, well, do you have a drawing of it? Do you know what its name is? And they're like, no, but sometimes they have a drawing of it, and if they have a drawing of it, then boom, it's that easy. It's simple, solved, done. Because you have its image. So its name and its image, they are the same power. Um, one second. Sorry about that. Um, its name and its power bear the same image. Uh, generally, the way in which you get uh, the name of something is by uh, knowing its office or knowing its appearance and then deriving some of that information or uh, tempting it, taunting it, uh, playing games with it, you know, like trying to fool it. If you're clever enough, it's not very hard. But it's sort of like if I were to try and get your name out of you, and you didn't want to give it to me. I could challenge your pride. You know, I could, um, I could accuse you of angelic attributes. That's my favorite one. Is <laughs> when a demon's possessing somebody and I'm like, wow, are you being honest with me? That's very uncharacteristic of you. And they're like, no, no, I'm not. And I'll prove it. <laughs> and, then they, uh, and then they tell me their actual name to prove that they would be dishonest with me. Um, that's, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, anybody else? I believe Zee Taco has been wanting to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had a question. So Fire away. So you, you talked about uh, how people, no matter what, are possessed. So what, what's your opinion on free will? Um, I'm, I'm going to correct your understanding of what I said first, because I said everybody, unless they have a banishing practice, is possessed to some degree. So uh, if you pray an Ave Maria once a week, if you go to church and you believe in Jesus as your savior and worship Yahweh, then uh, when he is invoked into the bounds of the building and you step onto said consecrated ground and cross over yourself, that is a banishing practice. Um, now, it's not a very powerful one, but it's enough to guarantee that you're not going to be possessed in some degree. So free will is a thing. Um, that is a discussion that I really don't want to have right now, but um, free will is, is definitely a thing, and I'm certainly not saying that our free will is taken away by spirits necessarily. Um, right. It just it, it it can be influenced by spirits and often is for people who are not actively taking measures against being influenced by spirits. All right, thank you. Sure, sure. Anyone else? Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground in this podcast. Um, mm -hmm. we've a lot of major topics. Uh, does anyone have a further question? I'm, I'm wondering whether I should go one step deeper here or not. 
Uh, I oh. guess I might as well. Uh, so since we've talked about demons, we've talked about ghosts, we've talked about the dead. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what can you tell us about Satan? Satan. What is <sighs> How did I know, Shogun? How did I know? Well, anyway, um, Satan, so-called, is a title. Um, the Satan is whoever presides over demons, sits on the hell throne, which is a literal, it's, it's a throne. It's carved out of black marble. And it, um, if you were to picture a line from where you're standing down to the center of the earth and far beyond it, the hell throne is placed on the tip of that uh, metaphorical rod. So it's all the way down there, under the underneaths, past the depths, all the way down on the opposite side of the throne of heaven. And it sits all the way at the bottom. And if you sit on it, you can look down and see all the spheres of hell below you and the earth, and then all of the heavens above that. So, um, yeah, whoever sits in that seat is Satan de facto. Okay. And how does this character that is sitting on the throne of hell affect us on earth, if at all? Uh, how does the president affect the people of his country? How does the president affecting the people of his country affect other countries? You see my point. So he is the governor. This is, you know, co coherent or consistent with our Christian theology that says that Satan is the, uh, the god of this world and the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. But his influence is not direct in the sense that we don't, we're not aware of Satan's presence. So he... <laughs> He's guiding the affairs of the earth directly, indirectly, and does he also, this is, I guess, a better question, right? So Christianity, to my understanding, teaches that Satan actually walked to and fro upon the earth in essentially the form of a man. Do you believe that Satan is physically embodied in the earth in a human form, what appears a human form? So I have to apologize first, because I believe I've led you to a misunderstanding. What I'm simply saying by the governance question my answer uh, is that Satan governs hell. So the edicts that he puts out to the demons affect the way in which the demons treat people. Um, much in the same way that uh, the govern government puts out an edict to its representatives in, say, uh, a federal organization. Of course, I, I understand that I'm comparing the two, but it's because they're structured in basically the same administrative hierarchy because it works. Um, Satan presides mostly over knowledge, um, specifically deep occult knowledge, the knowledge which gives power. And heaven presides mostly over responsibility. So it's necessary mostly to have both. And res by responsibility, you gain knowledge, but by knowledge, you do not necessarily gain responsibility. And... This is why Satan has become so unpopular, is because he, he, makes, he makes irresponsible sa uh, sages. You know, he, he, he creates people who have enough rope to hang themselves. And I'm sorry, you, you asked me something after that. Um, if he's, oh, if he walks yeah. on the earth. Yeah, okay. Um, well, it depends on who he is. So, for instance, up until recently, Satan was Astaroth. Um, or Astaroth was Satan. And Astaroth is an entirely... Or Astaroth, or um, Shaztero, or however you want to pronounce it, or Astarte, or Ishtar, whatever. That was the president of the Hell Throne. Of course... Ishtar, Astaro, Astarte, he was all kinds of other things as well. So he could be 62 humans. He could be 300 humans. 
he could literally be like a third of the population of India. I don't know. You know, <laughs> he could occupy so many people at the same time without it even taking a bite out of how big his spirit is that it's disturbing. So when you say, you know, something, something, Satan's the god of the world, it's entirely possible that we are all to some degree possessed by Satan. And now I, that would be a very pessimistic uh, view, but that could be the origin of the shadow self. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just spitballing for the purpose of illustrating the mechanism. Um, you under, I think you understand what I mean, right? Yes. And I think uh, to close the podcast, since we've had a solid uh, duration and covered a lot of ground, uh, I'd like you to tell us what you think of the spiritual or occult significance of Halloween, since we're approaching Halloween. What to you does Halloween mean metaphysically? I don't know why I'm struggling to phrase my questions concisely today, but uh, what is the spiritual or occult significance of Halloween? It's okay, Shogun. Uh, Mercury is retrograde in Scorpio, so um, everybody's having a tough time communicating. And technology is having a tough time supporting our communication. And travel logistics are having a tough time moving us from place and, you know, whatever else. Um, right. Your question, Halloween. Well, Halloween, very significant for witches, usually. Um, of course, it, it's originally sort of a pagan thing. Um, you'll notice that the the behavior of spirits is usually very tenable uh, up to and especially during Halloween. Uh, it's always a very uncomfortable time for me. I don't like it because, you know, I, I usually banish on the astral plane three or four times a day. Uh, literally, physically, at least once a week, um, if I'm using Enochian. Back when I did the LBRP, I did it every day. But um, during Halloween, especially Halloween night, uh, I'm almost consistently banishing like once every two or three hours because it's just terrible. There's just so much shit going on. And it's just a big, eerie cesspool of death horror and demons and nightmares and you know some people are into that uh personally i'm not uh i i would compare it to stepping in a puddle once a year and having it necessarily splash mud on your suit pants um it's a lot more significant to some other people and they like it a lot more i think it's just polluted and nasty um so i mean that's kind of a bah humbug i guess but um you know it's fun like we're gonna build a conveyor belt to uh wheel candy out to the kids and not expose them to coronavirus um but other than that man i mean it's it's spiritually kind of a hellhole as a holiday but uh i think the festivities are fun and i'm glad people enjoy it so, right. so it's, a, it's a pagan holiday too, right? Did you mention that? I did. I did. Okay. All right. So uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Eggbase, do you have any closing thoughts or messages for both the live audience here with us today and the audience that will listen later on uh, on BitChute and YouTube? Uh, in other words, uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. So I'm wondering if you have a closing statement or, or message for the audience. Um, sure. I'm just going to try and hit all the bases in the, uh, about 60 seconds. Uh, vampires are really great people. Help them out if you can. Uh, they won't hurt you. They're just normal people who have like a really terrible, tragic medical necessity. So uh, they make great friends because they're very down-to-earth people, but um, help them out if you can. Uh, don't ever fuck with demons unless you're like smarter than a fifth grader, and almost nobody is. <laughs> so uh, don't mess with demons and if you do I won't bail you out um, what else uh, yeah look out for Satan <laughs> um, and uh, ghosts 
especially ghosts of people that mean something to you, are not always what they appear to be. And uh, with that, I would advise everybody to stay very spiritually safe and hygienic and uh, establish a regular banishing practice because you're probably at least very slightly possessed. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, host this event, Mr. Igbase. That was a wonderful event. We covered a lot of ground, a lot of fascinating content. I also want to thank the audience for attending. And uh, I also wanted to uh, touch again, Ig, based on the, um, something I think I mentioned before, which is that we're, we're creating a series of weekly shows, right? As you know, we do daily podcasts, but we want to do recurring weekly shows. So, so far we have Philosophy with Jigmo every week. We also have uh, the Hermetics uh, podcast weekly with Toth thought sorry he goes by thought and uh, i was wondering if you would at least want to consider doing a weekly show uh, of your own which uh, i thought could be called uh, enlightenment with egg based or i can't remember what the other whatever right you could come up with your own name for it um, esoterics with egg based was the other name you egg, suggested oh, yeah. to me. would that be something you would consider uh well i actually am already considering it because you asked me about it before Right. As you know, my memory is not uh, excellent, but uh, had you agreed to it or not? I can't remember. No, I said I wanted to do, uh, I said I'd be remiss if I agreed to do a weekly show only having produced one podcast for it. So right. um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little more time to consider it. Uh, I am kind of a busy man, <laughs> which uh, you wouldn't know if you saw how much time I managed to spend on Discord. But, oh, I know that uh, those two things aren't mutually exclusive from personal personal experience, but that's great. I, I just touch on it, and uh, uh, hopefully that's something that can evolve in the future. Uh, and I understand that you're busy, and we value everybody's time because um, we know everyone's volunteering their time and energy here, which is what makes the server so great. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your information. Uh, we're going to have a podcast again tomorrow. Uh, which is Saturday, and uh, bear with me while I check. Uh, it's really bad, my memory. But um, anyways, uh, join us again tomorrow for whatever podcast we're having. Uh, on Sunday at 4 p.m. CT, we're going to have a very special podcast with myself, uh, Dreamily Resonant VIP, and Mr. NSA, as well as anybody else that can join us about something that I call the spiral code. And Dreamly calls the Divine Dance, and NSA, I think, might call the program, or at least some of the information he's posted calls, I think, the program. So you're going to hear three different takes on this, and uh, this is one I would really like people to try and attend. I think it'd be very interesting indeed, very personal to myself and Dreamly and NSA. So again, Spiral Code Podcast, 4 p.m. CT. Uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Eggbase, and everyone who's listening. Make sure you join the Roundtable Discord server. You can just Google Roundtable Discord. Uh, we have over 160 podcasts. They are available on YouTube and BitChute, uh, as well as all our social media, the Gilded server, Facebook group, etc. So we're going to close now. Join us again tomorrow. Keep an eye on the announcements channel for upcoming events, RT podcast for past events. If everyone would just join me in maybe round table one, I'd love to keep talking with you fine people for the remainder of the night. But we will now vacate this channel. Uh, God bless, and thank you, one and all.